Hello, my name is Johanna Lidén. Uh, I'm from Stockholm, uh, Sweden, and I work uh, on a postdoc project which is about neo-confucianism as ritual and educational praxis. Today, I will talk about a text written by a village school teacher from the 19th century, Tsun Xue Yan Yu. His name was Liu Hengdian, and he lived in the Weiyuan County in the Sichuan province. For me, this is not only a scholarly project, it is personal since I have worked as a teacher for more than 20 years. And despite the distance in time and space, I recognize myself in the concerns and thoughts of Liu Hengdian. Uh, like Liu Hengdian, I was teaching my mother tongue, uh, Yuan, in my case, Swedish. Uh, and I was teaching religion, including ethics. Politicians and administrators still believe in that studying ethics improves morality, but there is no scientific evidence for that whatsoever. There is, however, clear evidence that children do not do what we say, but what we do. Liu Hengdian was aware of this and had pedagogical solutions for it. We know quite a lot about the examination system, especially on higher national level, but we know much less about education at the local level. I wrote an article on charity schools in the Ming Dynasty, recently published in the journal Ming Qing Yanjiu. For this article, the sources I used were written by officials describing good guys establishing charity schools with the aim of making the students behave according to neo-Confucian morality. However, the voices of the teachers and the students were silent. Therefore, I was happy to get access to this text by Liu Hengdian. Now I had a vibrant voice of a village school teacher with lots of concrete experiences and ideas about schooling and pedagogy. Today, I will talk about first, Liu Hengdian's philosophy of education. Uh, second, uh, how he thinks we should deal with students and group dynamics. And finally, didactics and how to read. Liu Hengdian belonged to a religious movement, the Liuman tradition, which mixed Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist practices. Therefore, one might think that Liu Hengdian does not fit into a project on Neo-Confucianism. I will not deal with the question of how to define Neo-Confucianism here, but you will see from my presentation that Liu Hengdian was influenced by Neo-Confucian thinkers. The Liuman practitioners labeled themselves Confucians, and Liu Hengdian applied Neo-Confucian philosophy to his own situation as a teacher. For instance, he argued that the teacher shall, uh, quotation, complete himself and complete others, assisting heaven and being one with earth, end quotation. And furthermore, new quotation, heaven and earth give birth to human beings but they do not educate us, end quotation. See how important the teacher is. Like his early Western counterparts, he regarded teaching as a mission. He says that teaching is a holy task. My grandfather worked as a village school teacher. I would guess he also had ideas about teaching as a mission, not very different from working as a pastor or a priest. 
He was teaching grade one to six with all his three children in the same class. My mother was the youngest and the one who was asked to play the organ to accompany the psalm singing. As you can see, teaching was a part of a bigger context, which in its essence was regarded as holy. How can the teacher fulfill his holy task, according to Liu Hengdian? Most important is that the teacher has to practice self-cultivation and he has to respect himself, which is a part of self-cultivation. The idea of self-respect came from Wang Gun, who became a disciple of Wang Yangming in the early 16th century. Wang Wang Gun was the founder of the popular Taizhou movement. A main idea was that if one respects and loves others, others will respect and love you. But that it is also important to respect and love oneself and not sacrifice oneself for elder relatives and superiors. Liu Hengdian applied those ideas to his profession as a teacher. Parents might think that it is useless to pay for a teacher when they can teach their children to read themselves. But Liu argues that the teacher knows how to explain the meaning of the characters and the texts. The teacher understands the whole process of learning and should be able to create a, a schedule for a whole school year. Except for knowing his own value, respecting himself also means that the teacher should take his job seriously and not, quotation, frequent prostitutes, engage in gambling, drink excessively, smoke foreign tobacco, and other superficial things, end quotation. This, since the students do what the teacher does. Here we can see a teacher and some children which look like they are quite young. Liu Hengdian uh, taught both young and older boys. He emphasized the importance of adapting the teaching uh, to uh, children of different capabilities. Some are intelligent and can learn more in a short time. Uh, others are slower. He mentions that the teacher should not have the same requirements on children with difficulties. If you press them too hard, they might get ill, he explains. And why force them to learn several classics, which they will forget when they leave the classroom? It is better to do a few things and do them properly than reading a lot in a sloppy way. Group dynamics was a sensitive issue for Liu Hengdian. Mixed in the classroom were some young, innocent and weak boys and other older, crafty and strong. The teacher can fall into several traps, Liu warns. One is to let the older teach the younger children while the teacher himself is doing something else. For instance, go downtown to visit wine shops and prostitutes. That easily turns into a tyranny of the older students over the younger ones. Another trap for the teacher is to leave the school Beware that the older students might do as the moral teacher does, immoral teacher does, that is, go downtown to the wine shops, visit prostitutes, steal things, and so on. Furthermore, accidents might happen, and Liu gives several examples from real life of accidents with fatal outcome. The teacher has to be the boss in the classroom. Liu is realistic about school and that children can learn all sorts of things there, good and bad. And they often learn vulgar language from older students. The puberty is something a teacher has to deal with. Those students whose, quotation, desires have been opened up, end quotation, influences the younger ones. The teacher has to make sure 
that this does not happen and separate the younger from the older boys. As for group dynamics, we also have the question of whether a teacher should use corporal punishments or not. Liu Hengdian is not totally against it. The teacher has to set himself in respect. And if there are boys who misbehave, he has to set an example to the other's aim. And we can see here the teacher who is uh, uh, beating up this boy and the other boys um, <clears throat> who are looking at it. And they are also the target of this action of the teacher because they are supposed to learn from it. So, however, Liu seems to follow the tradition of Wang Yaming, who argued against beating the students. In this regard, he was a kind of Chinese precursor to the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget. He viewed play as integral to the development of intelligence in children. After the Second World, uh, World War, European psychologists and educators started to criticize what they called black pedagogy. It refers to using manipulative means and violence such as corporal punishments. But back to Liu Hengdian, in his view, it is dangerous to scold and beat the pupils. The intelligent children will become dull and the dull children will become even duller, he says. And he gives several examples of how destructive it is for a teacher to beat his pupils. I will quote one. And here I give you the text in Chinese uh, while I am reading my own uh, English translation. A certain teacher from my village was in exclusive possession of teaching and became known for beating the children. If there was a pupil who could not recite the text by heart, he would easily hit him several tens of times with a plank. Every night at midnight, he would painfully beat those who were craving for sleep while bending over their desks and do so until they woke up. When pupils became extremely drowsy, they would go to the toilet to get a short relief while leaning against the wall to sleep. When the teacher noticed that the boy was absent, he would clasp the plank and search for him. And when he caught him, he would beat him severely to wake him up. People from the village called him the iron beater. And this was literally true. Rustics and nitwits in the village did not know how it was, but on the contrary, praised the man as a good teacher. Many families sent several boys to study with him. Some of them had physically strong boys who could endure the torture. Others had physically weak boys who often fell ill because of the treatment. Some even died young and their parents believed it was their fate, not knowing that it was the teacher who had injured them. As for concrete teaching, Liu Hengdian uses an old saying, to be a teacher of the classics is easy, to be a teacher of human beings is difficult. In Neo-Confucian interpretation, this means that it is easy to teach students reading books and writing essays, but it is difficult to te teach them self-cultivation. The latter is the most important task. Still, for Liu Hengdian, the method was to recite the classics. By reciting, one should read it with one's whole body. Back home, the work was to memorize the text and let it digest for a few days. Then one should read it again and recite it together with the breathing. 
finally the classics will enter the heart and the student would benefit from it for a whole life. This is in essence, the same theory of reading as was propagated by Joshi. And if you want to read more about that, I referred to Dailian Bain's interesting thesis on the topic. He is also here at the conference. Uh, to summarize, one, teaching is a holy task with the aim of making the students into good persons. To be able to do so, the teacher must practice self-cultivation and self-respect. Only if he knows self-cultivation, he can pass on his knowledge to the students. Two, the teacher must adapt his teaching to the capabilities of the children. It is dangerous to punish the students but a teacher also must set himself uh, in respect. Furthermore, it is important to prevent stronger students from harassing the weaker. Three, texts should be read several times and with the whole body, including the breathing. The aim was that the text should reach the heart of the student so he could keep it as a treasure for his whole life. Liu Hengdian follows earlier Neo-Confucian thinkers criticizing the classicists for not applying their theoretical and bookish knowledge to real life. Through the art of recitation, the practitioners physically and mentally embody the tradition. Uh, to live the tradition with body and mind could be a mini definition of self-cultivation. As far as I know, there are no museums of village schools in China, but there are in Nanjing one museum of civil service examinations, which I visited for uh, a few years ago. So I will end this presentation with a picture from this museum. I couldn't stop myself from uh, trying uh, the examination box. And uh, luckily, the guards of the museum didn't discover it. So thank you and goodbye.